welcome everybody to The Coast is Queer. Um, probably the best name for a festival ever in the history of the world, I think. And uh, I'm Rosie Garland and I am absolutely thrilled and delighted to have been invited to talk with the uh, inspiration and powerhouse that is Val McDermid. Um, it is, what can I say? Um, well, I can say quite a lot really. Um, I'm sure I'm telling everybody exactly what they know, but um, Val McDermid has been dubbed the queen of crime. So uh, we know where we are today. Um, she has sold over 17 million books to date across the globe and has been translated into over 40 languages. Um, perhaps she's best known to people out there for the Wire in the Blood series, which features clinical psychologist, Dr. Tony Hill and DCI, Carol Jordan. And that was adapted for television starring Robson Green and Hermione Norris. But it's not just that. Um, Val is also known for her three other detective novel series. There's private detective Kate Brannigan, there's journalist Lindsay Gordon, who incidentally is the, was the UK's first openly lesbian detective and journalist. And most recently, cold case detective Karen Peary. Not content with all of that, she's also published several award-winning standalone novels, uh, books of non-fiction, short story collections, and a children's picture book charmingly and wonderfully entitled My Granny is a Pirate and um, her latest novel featuring Karen Peary is Still Life that's out now and um, did I say award-winning I think I did um, Val has won many awards I'm not going to rattle them all off or we will be here for the entire session I think um, but she has just to touch on a few, um, she's won the uh, Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger for Best Crime Novel of the Year, the Crime Writers Association Cartier Diamond Dagger, which sounds fabulous, the Grand Prix des Romans d'Aventure. How many writers can say they've won the Grand Prix? And uh, the Lambda Literary Foundation Pioneer Award in 2011, the Stonewall Writer of the Year, the LA Times Book of the Year Award. And, um, and, she, and in 2017, she was elected a fellow of both the Royal Society of Literature and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, she's also an experienced broadcaster and you will have seen her regularly on the electric television and radio. Um, I told you she was an inspiration and powerhouse, didn't I? Was I lying? No, I wasn't. So um, let's start at the very beginning. Mm. Come on into our online room, um, pull up a chair fix yourselves a drink of something chilling. So let us start at the very beginning, as I said, it's a very good place to start. Val, um, can you tell us about an early experience when you learnt that language has power? Well, I was introduced to books at a very early age. Uh, my mother, uh, my father too, were of the generation of working class people that understood that the way you got a better life for your kids than the one they'd had was through education and through through books. And my mum used to take me to the library well before I could read. She'd put me in my pushchair and wheel me across the council estate to the local library and read me picture books. Uh, and then when I was six years old, we moved house to live opposite the central library. And for me, that was that was kind of my paradise. I was an only child, so... You know, I had plenty of time by myself to use my imagination and to spread my imagination's wings with the books in the library. But the moment I sort of remember as a kind of seminal moment of understanding the force of language actually came in the theatre. Um, although I lived in a town that had a theatre, it wasn't used for theatrical productions very often. It was used for flower shows and school prize givings and the annual pantomime. But uh, at twice a year, the Dundee Rep Company would come for a week's performances. 
And I remember seeing a performance of The Changeling, a Jacobean revenge tragedy. And I must have been about 13 or 14. And there's a moment where in the play, the, 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 the villain of the piece uh, wants, wants a, a ring and he cuts the finger off the hand of the person who's wearing the ring and comes onto the stage with brandishing this finger with the ring on it. And I remember that absolutely electrifying moment of understanding the power that you could have with language, with drama, uh, and, and, and it was just electrifying. And, and I can still see that image in my head. I can still remember that moment of, of absolute horror and excitement. And, and as I say, that sense of what you could do with words. Yeah, absolutely. Um, God, that was ringing so many bells. I'm wondering whether it's resonating for people listening in. Um, that idea of um, spending a lot of time in your imagination, particularly if you're an only child. I mean, I wasn't, but I did seem to spend a lot of time in my imagination, if I'm honest. And oh, yeah. those trips to the library. Oh my goodness, they were the highlight of my week. So mm -hmm. I really get that. Well, for me, I could go every day because it was just across the street, you know, and, and I did, you know, I would go every, every day and change my books because um, back in those days, it's not like now where you can go in and like take 30 books out. It's, it was you could have four books, but two of them had to be non-fiction in Presbyterian Scotland. So I could cheerfully get through two books, two, two novels in an evening when I was wee. That's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, it was only, we only went once a week, so um, I'm, I'm now jealous. What a rich world. I could just spend an hour talking to you about being a kid and just being introduced to the magic of language. Your story about the changeling is absolutely marvellous. For me, that chilling moment was Edgar Allan Poe, yeah. the pit and the pendulum, that moment where the pendulum starts swinging and he can... And somehow Edgar Allan Poe gets over the idea that he can smell the metal... And that was incredible. Mm. So here we are, we're, we're talking about being younger selves and writers before we knew it. I think so, I think so. I mean, I, I was certainly telling myself stories from a very early age, but I also discovered quite early on that writing was a job and that came from reading. I discovered, that I, I used to read the Chalet School books, uh, which is a series of, of girls' school stories set in first in Austria, then in Switzerland. Um, and I love the Shelley School books. Uh, and one of the characters in the books grows up and becomes, in a way we would now recognise as being very meta, she becomes a writer of girls' school stories. Um, <laughs> but in one of the books, she, she gets a letter from her publisher. And in this letter, it was a cheque. And I remember this sort of moment of dawning, thinking, oh my God, this is a job. You get paid money for doing this. You know, it's just making stuff up. It's just telling lies. I could do that. Um, and that was that was really about the age of about nine, I think, when I formed the, the intention of becoming a writer. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, if you could, I mean, thinking about that nine-year-old writer self, if you could tell her anything, what would it be, do you think? Um... I don't know, I think there's, there's the two things I'd probably say. One, one thing would be, it's going to get better. Uh, but the other thing I would say is, is to be patient, to be persistent. Um, I think even then I understood that, you know, people like us didn't get to be writers. Uh, you had to work at it. Uh, and uh, that sense that uh, you had to have a proper job to fall back on. Uh, so I, I knew right from the start that it wasn't going to be an overnight thing. Uh, but there's been many points where, you know, I've tried and tried and tried again and failed and gone back and done something different and, and tried to make that work. So I think for most writers, your, your early career is a story of attempts and failures. And you just have to be patient and you have to be persistent. And sometimes it's not just about the other kinds of patience you need as well. When you have that brilliant story in your head, a wonderful idea, and you can see you can see the story sort of spread out before you. You you know the characters in the story, and you can't find the structure. You can't find a way to tell the story, and again, it's one of those things. I mean, you, all you can do is park it, and and then wait for wait for it to come back to itself. I mean, that's the longest I spent 
trying to figure out a book was 12 years. And uh, I wrote the first 10,000 words of that book five times and chucked it away five times because I just didn't have the right structure, didn't have the right voice, it wasn't working. I had a brilliant story and I, and I couldn't find a way to tell it. And when I finally did figure out how to tell it, it wasn't because of anything I'd done, it was because the world had changed. And it was, it was, it, it's a book called Trick of the Dark. And at the heart of this, this book is Unreliable Narrators. And I had to find a reason why one person who had worked so hard at remaking herself would revisit her past. And I could not, I could not work it out. I couldn't find a way to do it that wasn't really clumsy and, and full of like lengthy exposition. And then what happened was uh, the great success of Angela's Ashes and all those misery memoirs that came out around about that time. You know, you couldn't walk into a bookshop without bumping into a misery memoir. And I thought, this character is someone who's become successful in her professional life, and I thought, she'd write the misery memoir. That's why, that's, that's the way into this. And so that, that opened the door to me, and, and that made sense of the structure. So I would say to myself, because I, I have a tendency towards impatience, uh, I want everything and I want it now, uh, I would say to myself, relax, it will be okay, just take your time, give it space, give it time. That that really is so helpful. I mean, just for myself as a writer, um, you know, that idea of needing persistence and trust, trusting yourself, trusting that it'll come. I sometimes call it bloody mindedness. That if I, you know, <laughs> yeah, that if too. I, bloody minded about being a writer I'd have probably stopped years ago um 12 years and mm. then it came together yeah you got it well and it was worth it absolutely yeah because you knew the story you wanted to tell but there was a chunk missing and the chunk came to you yeah it was as I say it was it was it was a structural thing it was how to tell a particular part of the story that just that in a way that that wouldn't send the reader to sleep, or in a way that actually made sense, that was credible. You know, because you're always you're always seeking after after authenticity, credibility. Um, because, and I think that's particularly the case with the crime novel, because everybody knows that murders are not solved the way we write about them in crime fiction. You know, it's not Detective Inspector Grumpy with his sidekick who has to buy the drinks. It's a team of sometimes hundreds of people doing persistently doing the same repetitive thing again and again and again. It's about the forensic science, it's about all the detail, and really it would make a very, very dull book to write about it as it is. And so uh, everything else that I do in the book has to be, in some sense, a quest for authenticity. So I have to write characters that people believe in, and I have to write about places that they can, if they don't know already, they can see in their mind's eye. And it's all about finding those ways to make it feel like this could happen, even though at the back of their heads, the readers must know it couldn't possibly happen like this. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's really great because I think some people would just want to know about your research. And it's like research isn't the story. Um, I think it's the um, amazing writer Tom Clancy um, um, gave me a phrase which I, I keep as a mantra, which is tell the damn story. Yeah. Um, that's what, you know, if you want to go and read a, textbook on forensic you know, forensics brilliant but that isn't the story that isn't why people are so drawn to your novels mm. um it's it's the characters it's the story it's feeling for them it's as you say it's the authentic emotions feeling that something's real and that is very exciting yeah and i think that's that's um i mean how many times have you stumbled in a book and just gone i don't believe that I don't, I don't believe anyone would do that, or I don't believe anyone would say that, or I just don't believe that a character would think that way. And those are the points where you, you step out of the book and the reader the reader is lost to the writer at that point because yeah. the relationship's broken, the chain's broken. And you might go back to the book, but it'll never be quite the magical experience as it was to begin with until that deal was broken. Yeah. It's like you've been bounced out of the story, mm. right? and pulled into it yeah 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 i mean there have been occasions when i have thrown a book across the bedroom so like, oh for fuck's sake 
And I'm sure, you know, like, people may be, you know, rather more moderate than me, but I'm sure they've had a similar sort of experience. Oh, no, no, no. Um, Dorothy Parker famously said, some books should be tossed aside lightly, some should be hurled with great force. So um, I, you're channeling Parker, so mm. that, that sounds good to me. And um, you do seem to be um, talking about one of the other questions I really wanted to ask you. In fact, I'm going to ask you, can't I brave? It's like, I mean, I feel I learn about how to write a novel with every single one I write. Um, and what do you think are some of the common traps for aspiring or indeed struggling writers? I think one of the, the traps that a lot of uh, writers in their early stages go through is the urge towards perfection. They rework and rework and rework that first chapter because they think somehow you've got to get the first chapter right. It's got to be impeccable before you can move forward. I mean, and that, if you do that, you're never, ever going to write the end because you're never, ever going to write the perfect first chapter. And the thing with first chapters is that uh, they're just a springboard. They start you off. And I would say nine times out of ten, I go back to the beginning, at the end of a book, and tweak that, that opening chapter, that opening section, because in the light of, as it were, what I know now about the story, uh, I know it's got to be manipulated in some way to work better. So you're never going to get it right. And I think a lot of people spend too long... I say overworking, and the writing ends up being overwrought and, and precious or, or, or clunky. I, I think it's the best thing you can do is just to hammer on and get to the end and then going back and fix it. Uh, and I think the other trap that people sometimes fall into, particularly if you've had a success early on, is to think that you know best all the time about your own work. And uh, uh, I'm here to say that, that you don't always know best about your own work. And the, the value of having a good editor that you can trust, you can't put a price on it. I've been lucky. Um, I've, had a, uh, I've had three really good editors in my career. Um, and they've all understood the way that I like to be edited. We work well together. They edit the way I like to be edited. Uh, they're not prescriptive. We, 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 we initiate a discussion about things that mostly I already know are not right, but I've done the best I could do on the day. And in the process of discussion, I can find the way to resolve those problems and, 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 and sort them out in the rewrite. So I think that's one of the things is, is, is to be willing to acknowledge that you are not the ultimate arbiter of, of your novel, that there are, there are people whose job it is to help you make it better. And it's a sensible thing to listen to them. This is music to my ears. It really is. In fact, Val, this is like a masterclass, a mystery <laughs> class, if you will. I don't know about that. That is being recorded because, I mean, seriously, this is, this is wonderful. And it's what I say to people that I mentor a lot. It's like, don't keep going back and polishing that first chapter. This is, one, thank you so much for saying this. And yeah, I mean, editors, I love a good editor. Um, I'm working with a fantastic editor at the moment. And um, what can I say? A, a good editor wants to help me make my writing the best it possibly can be. Mm. I mean, what's, what's not to like? Exactly, that's their job. Um, and, and the other thing is to, you know, I, I said earlier that everybody knows murders are not really solved the way we write about them. But the, the areas where you can be authentic, you should always be authentic. So if, if you're writing a, a police procedural, you should have the law, the legal bits should work. You know, you should just make stuff up as you go along about the legal system um, and, and how, how things actually are, are, are carried through. Um, and uh, you can actually make it work for you. One of my early novels, the Kate, one of the Kate Brannigan novels, uh, Crackdown, takes place over the course, uh, essentially, of, of, of a five-day long weekend. And... It is entirely predicated on the timetable of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act and the processes that, that are gone through by the police when once someone is arrested and the time frame that you have to operate within and what is possible to happen within that time frame. And it was great fun because it was such a challenge to get everything to fit, to make it work uh, in that time frame and, and to make it possible. So in that instance, it was it was using this using the the difficult reality to make the book a challenge for me to write um, but equally you know you have to 
you have to stay within the, those bounds of, of what's possible. I remember I was I was mentoring a course one time uh, at Moniac Vor, the Scottish Writing Centre up in the Highlands, um, and uh, someone had come in to to her tutorial, and she announced to me that she she had already written the first three books of her series. Uh, and she was convinced that she was going to find a publisher who was going to turn her into a star. And the setup she had chosen was uh, a specialist squad looking only at serial homicide that consisted of six young detectives who had come straight from university, done their basic training, and were in the graduate fast stream, and a detective inspector. And I'm like, that's never going to happen. There is not a police institution anywhere in the world that would consider that a reasonable approach. And she was really upset. She was really offended with me. Not with what she'd done, but with she said, like, well, it, it's fiction. I can make it up. I can do what I want to do. I said, yeah, but people are not going to believe this at all. You know, you can, of course you can make it up. Of course you can, you can stretch the bounds of possibility, but you have to start with a basic setup that is recognisable as something that could work, something that's coherent. Yeah, it's the it's the, as you say, it's the idea that um, it's got to be right. Um, it, but for me, the whole thing about getting your research right is it's got to be so right that it becomes invisible. Yeah. So it's like, for example, the novel I set in the Middle Ages. Um, I couldn't have people riding bicycles, but that for me, that's just like a given. It's like yeah. it, it, people shouldn't notice. When, when it's absolutely right. But you can't get anything wrong either because, again, people are thinking about the story. Yeah. That's what, what it's there for. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and to go on, because, yes, let, let's talk about um, your crime novels. You do write some really gritty stuff. It's like that isn't a spoiler. Um, so how do you balance making demands on the reader and taking care of them? Um, the short answer is I don't think very much about readers when I'm writing, uh, because I think that that can lead you into a very difficult area where you're trying to second guess. What are people going to think when they read this? Are people going to like this? Are people going to be offended by this? Uh, am I going to upset people? And I write the books that, in a way, I write the books I would like to read. I'll... I want to tell the story. I want to tell the story in, in the way that, that it needs to be told. And that's first and foremost what I'm trying to do. And I think the greatest duty I can give a reader is to write a bloody good book. And I'm not going to write a bloody good book if every other page I'm thinking, oh dear, what will uh, so-and-so in the Highlands think of this? Or, or what will somebody in the south of England who votes Tory think of this? Uh, I, I write the book that I need to write. I don't mean to suggest that I don't care what readers think. Of course I care what my readers think. But that comes afterwards. That comes once the book's in their hands and when they come to a festival like this, when they talk to me, when they ask me questions. That's when the relationship with the reader comes, for me. It's not when I'm writing, because I, I think it's... The last thing a writer should be doing is censoring themselves. There are enough people telling us what not to say without us doing it to ourselves. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's like enough people censor us. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but um, there have been times when, um, the, you know, people have said to me the kind of, but why can't you write nice stories, dear? Um, you <laughs> when know, are you going I'm, to write a proper novel? Yeah, a proper novel. It's like, and also it's like, um, do you think it's so, you know, it's like writing as a woman? Do you think this is like suitable writing for a woman? Yeah. Some of that. I mean, I'm, I right. don't know about that. Yeah, I've never, I've never, in all the years that I've been doing this now, more than 30 years, I have never sat on a panel with men and have the chair ask any, or the audience ask any of them, how do you feel about writing violence against women? And yet, the, the overwhelming violence against women is perpetrated by men. It's, yeah. it's an interesting perspective. It is, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Going back to that whole idea of, um, I, I was fascinated when you were talking about it taking 12 years to get one of your novels right. Um, and OK, I'm going to put my hand up now and admit that I have three novels hidden under the bed that will never, ever see the light of day 
honest. <laughs> and um, I have to admit, I used to call them unpublished or failed. And then um, somebody gave me this wonderful word and said, no, 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 they're not failed novels, they're apprentice novels. And the fact that they're, seriously, nobody's ever gonna read them. Um, they're not good, that's why, they're bad. How many apprentice novels or far half-finished novels have you got? Um, I have got two uh, that I wrote very early on that are not crime novels. They are very much, very much apprentice works, and they, like you say, they will never see the light of day. My my partner is uh, is under instructions as my literary executor to destroy them after my death, but I keep them because it's useful to remind myself how much I have learned and how badly I can write. Um, the first, the first one though, the first, if you like, failed novel was actually, uh, ironically, the one that really got me, me started in my career as a, a, a paid writer. Um, I, I wrote this, this novel uh, when I left university. Uh, my first job as a trainee journalist down in darkest Devon. And uh, we were so badly paid, we couldn't even afford to go to the pub in the evening. So I would sit in my, my, my little room in a freezing cold flat uh, and, and, and wrote my novel. And because, you know, of course, I'd just done an English degree at Oxford, I was going to write the great English novel. Uh, and so I wrote this this novel that was all full of tortured human relationships and angst and guilt and, and pain and, you know, the kind of thing where somebody has to try and kill themselves in the second to last chapter. Um, and it was it was about this sort of tortured lesbian relationship, you know, and, the, and that was the period where uh, you still couldn't actually have a happy ending for lesbians, you know. <laughs> Um, and so I wrote this this novel, uh, and I I sent it I, when I finished it. And, I, and the one thing I will say about it is that I finished it, and I started sending it round publishers, and uh, I got it back practically by return of post everywhere I sent it. Uh, I I I often said that I think by the end I was getting letters from publishers I hadn't even sent it to, saying we've heard about this, don't send it to us. Um, and it was it was pretty pretty poor I think in many respects. Um, and uh, I, I showed it to a friend of mine who was an actor, and uh, she looked at this and, and she said, well, I don't know much about novels, but I think this would make a really good play. And I, conversely, didn't know anything about plays, really, so I thought, you just have to cross out the description and leave in the dialogue, and that's a play. And that's essentially what I did. I, I, I went through it and, and uh, took out the dialogue, wrote some extra scenes to cover the bits I was leaving out, uh, and off I trotted to the Plymouth theatre company with my play what I had wrote and uh, the director there was um, very effusive he said oh, I'm doing a season of new plays in the studio theatre and this would be perfect for my my season of new plays and so in, entirely accidentally uh, I was a professionally performed playwright at the age of 23 and I didn't have a clue what I was doing um, I'd written this play uh, I adapted it for BBC radio and of course, because it was a tortured lesbian relationship at the heart of it, although um, it was supposed to be originally for Radio Radio 4, they passed on it. Uh, radio 3 passed on it. So I ended up going out on Radio Scotland. Um, and uh, at the time I was living in Manchester, and I can remember having to drive halfway up the M6 to pick it up on, on, on the radio, the car radio, because it was only on Radio Scotland. Um, anyway, I adapted it for the BBC, and I got an agent. Uh, and I then got uh, my second commission, which was, bizarrely, uh, having written this tortured, tortured drama of, of uh, lesbian guilt and love and pain, uh, I was commissioned to write a children's Christmas pantomime, a science fiction pantomime with a cast of five. Uh, and I, 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 it was a touring company in Lincoln and Humberside where I, I, I knew the, the team who ran it, and they... they they commissioned me properly through the Arts Council and everything to do this. Uh, and because I was working with a very good director, it worked. But the trouble was, is I had no idea really how a play worked, the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of putting a play together. And back then, I mean, we're talking here the, the early 1980s, there really wasn't um, much in the way of support for learning the nuts and bolts of your craft. There weren't all these marvellous courses that you can go on now um, run by things like the Arvon Foundation and stuff, um, and Moniac Vor and New Writing South and New Writing North and you know sort of Book Trust Scotland. They just didn't exist, and so I didn't I didn't know how to find out how to do what I wanted to do for the theatre. 
Um, and so I kept trying to write these plays, and they're terrible plays. Uh, and eventually, after two, three years of this, my agent fired me. Uh, and that was really the low point for me, was uh, was getting fired by my agent. Because I thought, if the person who stands to make money off anything you'd succeed at is getting rid of you, you must be really crap. Uh, but there we go. And I, and I, I it, that's really what kick-started me into writing a crime novel. Because by that stage, I understood that why I kept failing as, a, as an apprentice playwright was that I didn't really understand what I was doing. And so I thought, well, maybe what I should do is concentrate on writing something where I do understand how the form works. And I'd read crime fiction since I was really quite small. Um, I first discovered Agatha Christie when I was about eight or nine. Uh, I used to stay a lot at my grandparents' house, and they were not readers. Uh, they only had two books in the house. They had the Bible, of course, uh, and for some reason, Agatha Christie's Murder at the Vicarage. Uh, and that was my introduction to Agatha Christie and to crime fiction, and I just loved that book. Uh, whenever I ran out of library books when I was staying with them, I'd reread The Murder at the Vicarage. I just, I loved, and I mean, I look at it now, and I think, I think I was lucky that that was the first crime novel I read, because it's actually Christie at the peak of her powers. It's, it's the first Miss Marple, and it's a beautifully constructed piece of work, because you've got the, the overarching storyline of, of the murder, but there's lots and lots of subplots that come in and out. So whenever there's not much happening in the main story, there's a, there's a wee bit of excitement in the subplot that keeps you engaged. And it's like all these intersecting arcs that go all the way through underneath the main arc. And I look at it now, as I say, and I, I see this beautiful piece of structure, clever narrative structure. But back then, I just, I just liked the book. It was, it was the puzzle. It was the, 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 the characters. It was trying to figure out what was going on. And of course, as I got older, I understood more about what was going on, because when you're, you're nine years old, you don't understand what someone having an affair means. Um, you just think they're pals, you know. Um, but uh, so that was that was really, I, I'd, I'd carried on reading crime fiction right from that point on. Uh, and uh, I guess that when it came to writing a, a crime novel, I thought, I understand the mechanics of this. You need to have a dead body. You need to have some sort of detective. You need to either have lots of suspects or no suspects at all, and then at the end you have some sort of resolution. So I was playing with this this idea, but um, the problem I kept bumping into was that uh, I didn't really know the world of, of contemporary UK crime fiction. It's in the early, mid-1980s, if you if you've lived that long to cast your mind back. Um, there were police procedurals and there were village mysteries, and I didn't really know how the police worked. Um, and uh, I thought you had to know about these things before you could write a police procedural. I remember having this conversation with Colin Dexter, you know, who of, of Inspector Morse fame, some years later. And I said, well, I couldn't write about the police because I didn't know anything about them. And he just burst out laughing. He said, you just make it up, dear. He said, I'd written five Inspector Morse novels before I even set foot in a police station. So I didn't know you could just make it up. I thought if you got it wrong, they'd come around and knock on your door and give you a bad time, you know. But... The other thing was, was, was villages, English villages. I mean, it's like science fiction for me. You know, I grew up in Scottish mining communities, which are not like St Mary Mead at all. Um, and so I just thought, I, I, can't, I can't write this world. And then uh, I had one of those Einstein moments, light bulb goes on in head. Uh, a friend of mine from university had moved across to America, and she sent me a copy of Sarah Paretsky's debut novel, Indemnity Only. Uh, introducing the wonderful Chicago Private Eye, V.I. Warshawski. And that just blew me away. Uh, I thought, here's a woman who's doing this job and she doesn't have to get the boys in every time there's something difficult comes along. She's got agency, she's got a brain, she's got a sense of humour. And the books the books had politics too. They had, a, they had personal politics and social politics. But one of the things that really struck me with that first uh, V.I. Warshawski novel and struck me really forcibly, was that this was not just some random murder bolted onto some random place. The crimes had their roots in that society. It, they happened because people lived the lives that, that they lived. They were predicated on the jobs they did, the kind of district that they lived in, the kind of city Chicago was. That In a sense, that story couldn't have happened in the same way somewhere else. And that really excited me. I thought, this is a way to write about the world you live in, not about some strange 
village that that isn't real in any sense, and not to write about a, a police station that doesn't doesn't have any sense of reality to it. This is this is a way to to set these books very firmly with a sense of place, and that. I thought this is the kind of book I would love to write and maybe if I try really, really hard one day I'll be able to write something half as good. And that got me off my backside in actually writing uh, the book that became Report for Murder. Right. And you've also made that wonderful point um, of how important reading is mm. for a writer um, and how it supports us. Um, I think St you know, Stephen King obviously says the best things about writing yeah. and there's it's like any writer who says they haven't got time to read shouldn't be a writer um and you've just um you know you've obviously got so much inspiration and support and permission to be a writer yeah. reading yeah. other people's books yeah um and, and i think it's it's um we're very lucky that we do a job where our, our apprenticeship, our training, involves lying on a sofa with a bar of chocolate, <laughs> reading. You know, I mean, it's not a hardship. It's not like going down the pit or becoming a carpenter where you have to spend years with, with, with various implements before you can actually make a table leg. You know, it's, 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 it's oh, pleasure. That, that's beautiful that your apprenticeship is spent on a sofa eating a bar of chocolate. That is wonderful. Thank you. OK, let's talk about some of the hard stuff as well. Um, thinking about, to go to your latest novel, um, Still Life, um, what was the hardest scene for you to write? What was the hardest bit to write? Um, I think most people would think that the hardest parts are the, the really emotional parts, um, where you're, you're dealing with a, a scene that has a great deal of emotional intensity. And those those are scenes that uh, present their own their own difficulties, but in a way those scenes are are in another way quite straightforward, because they're rooted in character. And you spend time with your characters, you can get a sense of how they react, because you, you you're mapping them onto your understanding of the world and your understanding of people. So while getting the detail of that can be quite difficult, um, the actual underpinnings of it. Are kind of there in your head already. That they're there in, in your the way that you you live in the world. The bits that I find hardest of any novel are where you've got a complicated physical scene, where you've got you, you, your characters have got to do a certain number of things in sequence, as it were. Um, and and so at the end of it, you've got, you start at point A and you've got to get to point Z and you've got to jump over the intervening obstacles in the right order, but make it interesting. So in that sense, there's, there's a scene towards the end of, of Still Life uh, where it's exactly it's a, it's a couple of chapters where things have to slot into place perfectly um, in order for the book to, to come to a proper conclusion. And that's the bit I always, that's the kind of bit I always find hardest when you've got to make all the, the working parts fit together uh, and, and and then so often when you've you've written the first draft of when I've written the first draft of that and I go back and I look through it and think no no that that can't happen because this hasn't happened first so you need to take that back and this has to happen first but then if that happens in that order then you've got a problem with this and so those are the things that I find hardest for me to get to get to a place where I'm satisfied with them yeah and you do clearly get to a place where you're satisfied hurrah and we are all we are we are benefit from that yeah. Um, but sometimes you get completely tangled up with stuff. I mean, the, I, I am I am notorious. Among, I'm, I've had the same copy editor for more than 20 years, and she does a brilliant job. And she is the sort of walking Bible on Tony Hill and Carol Jordan. Um, but she's she's um, she's absolutely ruthless. I mean, I'm, my, my favourite uh, copy editing query from her was some years ago now where my, the note read, you have eight, eight weekdays without an intervening weekend. Can you deal with this? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it makes me think about the, you know, the whole idea of getting things of continuity right. You know, mm. in that famous scene in Die Hard where Bruce Willis is wearing a, a white shirt, then a green shirt, then a white shirt. And it's like, once you've noticed that, you can't unnotice it. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, do you know what, Val? I'm going to use the L word, lockdown. 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, I know, it's like, we, we may as well say it like it is. Um, I'm just wondering how you found writing or not writing or what you have managed to work on or are working on during during lockdown. Yeah, I've I've um, I find I'm, I'm writing more slowly. I, 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 I get to the end of the day and I have fewer words than I would normally have at the end of the working day. Um, but when I when. I started, when I started writing Still Life uh, basically a year ago in, in January 2020 and in my head that book was always going to be set in February 2020 when I'd been planning it the year before I thought yeah this is going to I, set, I want to set this in the winter I want it to be cold and miserable and I'll set it in February 2020 then it's, it's kind of nailed down in my head and so I started writing it uh, and then when I started writing it was was not even the faintest flicker of a shadow of, of, of what was coming at us as I as I was writing the book, this this started to appear in my rear view mirror, as it were, uh, this sort of cloud getting bigger and bigger, and I thought I have to figure out a way to refer to this, but to refer to it in the same terms that Karen, living through February twenty twenty, would experience it. So there's two or three references through the book to this this thing um, that may or may not be anything, uh, and then the book ends on the the eve of lockdown. So I'm writing this book. I, fin- I mean, I finished the book at uh, the beginning of April. So I'm writing it as I have gone, as I'm now in lockdown, desperately trying not to impose the hindsight of lockdown on the book that is set, of course, before the lockdown begins. So those were sort of quite interesting juggling to, to, to do that with that and get to get it right, to, to not, not do, you know, had I but known, dear reader. Uh, and so, as I say, I was... When I, when I start when lockdown started, it was the time of year when I would be at home writing anyway, and not really going out very much. Uh, and so it was it was pretty much like like a normal a normal March for me because I was staying at home writing my book, going for walks every day with my partner like I would normally do when I'm finishing a book. Uh, and and so it was it kind of took a wee while to kind of creep up on me but once i've got uh, still life out the way uh, i had various other projects that came galloping along uh, i i edited a, a digital collection of short wor- short writings about homelessness and football to support the homeless world cup foundation which i'm on the board of um because of course obviously we couldn't have the tournament this year um, and then, of course, Joe and I, my partner, published a book called Imagine a Country earlier in the year. We actually published it in March. We were one of the first uh, event casualties of, of the lockdown because we were supposed to be launching the book at Bloody Scotland in March. And uh, two days before the book launch, we went into lockdown. So we had very hastily to, to do a, a virtual event. So after that, there was various other... Um, well, summer was quite a lot of, of virtual festivals and um writing other things. I, I wrote a short story for the short story collection that came out just before Christmas, Christmas is Murder. Um, and I, I, I had to start thinking about what I was going to do next. Um, I'm not very easy to live with when I'm not thinking about something or working on something. I'm not really very good at switching off and taking a break and, and, and leaving it all behind. I mean, when I go on holiday... I'm still thinking about a book. I'm still thinking about uh, uh, about what I'm going to write and 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 um, things trickle into my head and my consciousness. And I think, oh yeah, I could use that. I could use that. Um, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, we went on holiday to France. Uh, it was supposed to be this wonderful romantic uh, boating holiday on the Saone River in Burgundy, and uh, we had we had our boat and we were all sorted and. It was beautiful countryside, you know, you're on these rivers and canals and woodland and little villages. And unlike in the UK, in France, you can moor up anywhere at night. You can just tie up at the bank anywhere. And in order to facilitate this, they give you five sharpened metal stakes and a mallet. And I'm thinking, five sharpened metal stakes, mallet, woodland that's not accessible by road. I mean... It's just, how could you not think about murder? You know, and Joe's going, we're supposed to be having a romantic holiday. I said, yeah, but they paid absolutely no attention to you when we were picking the boat up at the boatyard. I could go back with anybody and they wouldn't notice. <laughs> and she said, you know, I'm starting to get twitchy about this now. 
um so so yeah things things um so i say I, i'm not i'm not easy to 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 be around really when i've not got a project to be thinking about have you got a project you're thinking about at the moment oh yeah i'm definitely i'm working on um i did i did a short uh, a short film for the national theater of scotland uh called first things they did a, a series of of uh, short short films um, and so that was an interesting thing to do because that kind of got my drama head on again and um, I've got a playing process at the Lyceum though God knows when we'll actually get that into production and I'm reading scripts for the second series of Traces and for Karen Pirrie which is supposed to be being filmed this spring though again who knows what's going to happen with lockdown but what I'm actually writing at the moment um, is something quite different because until now all of my books really have been set very much against the contemporary backdrop. They've been set against the here and now. Um, you can broadly speaking identify when they were when they were written, when they're set. Uh, and I can't do that just now because everything is in a state of flux. Things change from day to day, from week to week. Uh, we've we've had we've had COVID obviously. We've had Brexit obviously. Nobody quite knows where they are, and I can't write if I can't stand on solid ground. I have to be somewhere with my feet planted so I can look around me and think, what's possible in this environment? What's possible in this scenario? In this political situation, what's possible? In this practical situation, what's possible? And at the moment, I can't make those those decisions. Uh, and so I've had this idea kicking around my head for a wee while of writing a sequence of novels that, that covers a span of, 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 of time, really. Uh, and I thought that this is probably the time to, to start writing it. So I've got, I have planned a quintet of novels uh, that go 1979, 1989, 1999, 2009, 2019. Uh, and same protagonist, but not necessarily doing the same job throughout it. Uh, and that's that's what I'm writing at the moment. I'm writing 1979, and it's great because I know what happened in 1979. Yes, it's kind of a historical novel, but yep. not quite. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, I tell you this: um, the, Lin the Lindsay Gordon novels first published. First one was published in '87, and has is currently and it's, it's been optioned by a television company, and it's currently in development. And um, when we first started talking about this, they said, "Of course, it's period drama." <laughs> it's my life how can it be period drama it, it is bizarre how it is a completely different world no internet no mobile phones yeah you know yeah. it's like if you wanted to meet your friends down the pub you'd have to say let us meet down the pub and then meet them because yeah. nobody had ordinary telephones let alone mobiles yeah i know i'm 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 i'm, I'm dealing with this you know sort of conversations that get cut short because the pips run go out you know cut the phone off um and and you wrote, we wrote letters. That was how you stayed in touch with friends who were not living in the same town as you. You wrote letters and they wrote back to you. You know, I had, I had a friend uh, who went off to America after our, our finals in Oxford and we wrote to each other pretty much every week. And, and I, I came upon this whole bundle of, of airmail letters from her uh, when I was sorting out a load of, 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 of boxes of paperwork. A while back, and I thought, my God, this is like an artifact from a, a vanished age. Val, thank you so very, very much. Um, this has been an absolute treat for me. I know I feel like I feel like an incredibly lucky woman for being able to talk with you today, and um, I'm sure it's going to be a treat for everybody who's tuned in. Um, so thank you, thank you, The Coast is Queer, thank you, New Writing South. I am aware we have some questions. So, um, Val, unsurprisingly, we have had some questions from our virtual audience, all of whom are pleased to e-meet you or e-see you. Yeah. And um, the first one up is about the recent television series that you mentioned traces and um you've been working with amelia balmore yeah it's collaboration between the two of you yeah. and um collaboration is a well it's an interesting thing and i'm just wondering what it's been like for you what it was like for you to collaborate on traces with amelia 
Well, Amelia is great to work with. I would say that she did all the heavy lifting. I just did the sitting about, thinking about it and, and pontificating, really. Um, I'd had this idea for quite a while uh, because I know a lot of forensic scientists. Over the years, I've come to know a whole bunch of them covering a whole spectrum of, of specialities. And I actually wrote about a book about forensics a few years ago. Um, and I, the one thing that drives them all mad is the way that they're portrayed on television. I mean, you just say the word CSI to a forensic scientist and watch the steam come out of their ears. Um, and so I, 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 and I, this kind of baffled me because I didn't understand why you got these um, misleading portrayals of forensic science, what it is and who these people are and how they do their job. When the reality is it's full of really extraordinary stuff and wow moments. You don't have to pretend that one person, like in Waking the Dead, can do every element of forensics and, and, and in five minutes. So I thought it would be really good to have a television series that showed what forensic science was really like, um, that how, how it was done for real. I was working with the time with Professor Dame Sue Black at Dundee, who was at Dundee at that point, forensic anthropologist, and Professor Neve McDade, who's also at Dundee, who's a forensic chemist. She does drugs, fire and explosions, though generally not all at the same time. Um, and uh, we were talking about this, and, and I'd, I'd worked with them on what's called a MOOC, uh, which is an online uh, course that, that anyone can sign up to do. And we did this on online course uh, about a, a body found on Dundee Law, and I wrote the script, basically. I wrote the, the, the story for, of the MOOC. They all said, we want these things to be explored in the course of this, and can you write the setup, and then the story that will go with it at the end, the reward for, for completing the course is to get the short story. So I did that, and it was great fun, and I really enjoyed work, working in that way. Um, and then we thought about putting something together that would, would make a television series. So I put a wee outline together, and I went off and talked to Nicola Schindler at Red Productions. And she got very excited about it and said this was a great idea. And um, then we had to hook me up with a scriptwriter, because I said, I, A, I haven't got time to do this, and B, I haven't got the skills to do television scripting. It's a very different form of writing. Uh, it's a different, you visualise things in a very different way uh, and you write the script in a very different way. So I, I, I said, I can't do this. And Amelia had been writing Scott and Bailey uh, and uh, we were basically put together in a room to see how we got on and we just hit it off really well. And she loved the idea and I could see that she was going to be a, a good person to work with. And so we started. I the, the outline of the, the story, and then she basically ran with it. Uh, and I we, we both spent time with forensic scientists along the way, uh, sorting out detail and uh, uh, coming up with ideas. One of the things I like to do with the scientists is I go to them with an idea and say, will this work? And if they say, yeah, it'll work, that's fine, that's great. But then they'll often say, well, it wouldn't really work like that. Here's what you can do, though. And so we kind of did that with, with the, the scripting of that. And Amelia worked her butt off. I, I mean, she was so under the cosh. The timing was so tight because of the schedule for getting the thing filmed. And she was just amazing. Uh, I think she was a delight to work with. Uh, and we filmed it uh, last year. Filmed some of it on location in Dundee. And the rest of it we filmed around Manchester because that's where all the crew were based. Uh, and uh, it went out initially on Alibi channel and then it's been just been shown on BBC One prime time and it's had a fantastic response from people who've really really loved it. Um, I've been getting inundated on Twitter with people who've enjoyed it so much and I'm, I'm really pleased and I'm pleased for everybody who's been concerned with it because it was uh, a woman-led production. Female producer, female exec producers, female directors, female script writer, female script editor and, and, and a female-led cast. So it was been a, it was great working with a fabulous atmosphere on the set. Martin Compton said it was the the best atmosphere of any series he'd ever worked on, uh, and we've been commissioned to do a second series. Uh, so that's being the scripts are being finalised and polished as we speak, and the plan is for that to film in March. But of course, it all depends on on the restrictions uh, under COVID, because obviously we we have to abide by the rules and regulations. There are, there are certain procedures that uh, can be followed to, to make it possible to do some drama in that, in that way. But we'll just have to see 
what's possible when it comes to when we start filming. But there will be more at some point. Really exciting news. And yeah. um, I, particularly at the moment, um, having things to look forward to feel very, very important. And this feels like something for you and for everybody to look forward to. So everything crossed for that, Val. So we all need things, you know, we need things to look forward to, and whether they're small things or big things. You know, like I have ice cream on a Saturday night. <laughs> what a good idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it, it's like, it does make a difference to get, to help to build that persistence that you were talking about, just to mm. put one day in front of another and one word in front of another. Yeah. I believe we have time for one more question, and that is about My Scotland. Um, somebody sent in a question saying um, how much they loved My Scotland. Um, so that's good. And um, But the question is, did the writing of My Scotland, did it generate or create inspiration for any more of your novels or any more novels? Um, the short answer is not as such. Um, my Scotland, to explain to people who might not have come across it, was uh, a book of um, picked photographs by my friend Alan McCready, who's a wonderful photographer, uh, and me writing about the places that I'd written about in my novels, uh, why I chose them, what they meant to me, uh, why they spoke to me as settings for, for books. So it was a case really more of revisiting uh, places that I had, had that I knew already. Um, it, it was In a way, it was an expression of laziness, my Scotland, because you know, my, my publisher has uh, several times uh, pushed me towards writing a memoir, and I'm going, I can't write a memoir, I've, I've, I've got a really uninteresting life, you know, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not that exciting, I don't want to write a memoir, um, and uh, this was a way of getting my publisher off my back, uh, because it's a kind of memoir, and th that uh, the places that I'm writing about gives me the opportunity to revisit places from my childhood, and other places from various points of my life and what these places mean to me. Uh, so that was really what was the, the idea behind it. But what I will say about it was that it did remind me of, of um, one of the reasons why I, I, I love being back in Scotland, which is, you know, the, the, the range of settings that are immediately available to me within, you know, an hour or two's drive of my front door in normal circumstances. Uh, we've got cityscapes, you've got townscapes, you've got villages, you've got mountains, you've got sea. There's, it's an extraordinary range of backdrops to set fiction against. And I think for a lot of Scottish writers, that's one of the, the things we do really well, is that sense of place. And, and it's because it's a gift to us. It's, it's there every day when you, you look out your window, every day when you walk down the street. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, I, I, I will maybe make a comment about you saying about um, tending towards laziness. Um, I, I, I think just Trust looking me, I am incredibly lazy. <laughs> well, in that case, you are a very hardworking, lazy person. Um, and we've only got to look at your amazing range of novels and books. And indeed, Granny was a pirate. And uh, and also just say a huge thing. Thank you for your time, Val. It has been absolutely, I feel so thrilled. I feel very, I feel delighted to have had this chance to sort of like hurl questions at you and to listen to your inspirational answers. Oh, thank, you. thank you so very much indeed. This has been wonderful. So let's, I think we should all have a huge virtual round of applause. <laughs> with the strangest things. Um, of, of the lockdown and Zoom is when people do a round of applause and there's complete silence. But I hope you can hear the love coming <laughs> through to you right now. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. It's been lovely to talk to you and lovely to see you again. Um, and I hope the rest of the festival is a, a roaring success. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>